In today's battlefields, the first units to move aren't soldiers, they're machines. The US Army is integrating robotic mules and autonomous scout vehicles into its frontline brigades. In China, armed quadrupeds and AI-driven reconnaissance bots now train beside infantry. In India, defense labs are developing rugged, low-cost robots for high-altitude and border operations. And in Ukraine, remote-controlled gun platforms and bomb-carrying drones are part of daily warfare. Each of these machines represents a shift in military thinking, away from manpower and toward machine power. They don't replace the soldier outright, but they're changing what a soldier is expected to do. For the first time in history, machines aren't just tools of war. The evolution is happening fast. From remote-controlled bomb squads to self-guided drones and humanoid prototypes, modern warfare is being rewritten by code, sensors and silicon. The result is a new kind of battlefield, one where the side with the smartest machines, not the bravest troops, could decide the outcome. This is how the robot age of war began, and how it's redefining the future of combat, command and control. Every revolution in warfare begins with necessity. In the early 2000s, two long wars forced militaries to confront the limits of human endurance. In Iraq and Afghanistan, improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, became the deadliest weapon of insurgents. Each dirt road was a potential ambush. Clearing them was slow, lethal work. So engineers built machines to take the risk instead. The first generation of combat robots wasn't autonomous. It was remote controlled. Simple, rugged and expendable. iRobots, PackBot and Foster Miller's Talon became the backbone of bomb disposal teams. Soldiers operated them through consoles. Their cameras and arms crawled ahead to disarm explosives. By 2008, over 12,000 of these robots had been deployed across the US and NATO forces. Each one represented a small victory against the randomness of death. If the robot exploded, the human didn't. At the same time, above the skies, another robotic revolution was taking shape. Unmanned aerial vehicles, Predator and Reaper, proved that war could be fought remotely from thousands of kilometers away. Pilots in Nevada could strike in Kandahar with the click of a mouse. These early systems still relied on humans, but they revealed something profound. Autonomy didn't need to mean total independence. It could mean speed, precision and reduced exposure. As algorithms advanced, the distinction between tail-operated and autonomous blurred. Robots began navigating on their own, recognizing terrain, identifying objects, even planning routes. Software started doing what once required a crew of humans. And out of these lessons, the concept of the autonomous warrior was born. A machine capable not only of following commands, but of interpreting intent. By the 2010s, both the US and its rivals were experimenting with manned, unmanned teaming. Attack helicopters shared sensor feeds with drones. Tanks received targeting data from small ground robots ahead. The US Army's future vertical lift program envisioned crews commanding entire fleets of robotic wingmen. Meanwhile, Russia's Uran-9 and China's Sharp Claw prototypes hinted at a new kind of warfare, one where distance and data mattered more than courage. The question was no longer if robots could fight. It was how much fighting humans were willing to give up. Fast forward to today, and the mechanical soldier no longer rolls on tracks. It walks. Quadruped robots, robot dogs, are among the most recognizable faces of the new ground warfare. Their presence is almost eerie. Machines that move not like machines, but like things. Flexing, bounding, recovering balance when kicked. Boston Dynamics's Spot was the first to make the world look twice. Designed initially for industrial inspection, it quickly caught the Pentagon's attention. Weighing about 30 kilograms, Spot can carry sensors, cameras or communication gear, climb stairs and navigate rubble. 
The US military tested it for base patrols, tunnel mapping, and nuclear inspection. It became, in essence, the perfect scout. Quiet, tireless, fearless. Then came Ghost Robotics Vision 60, a heavier military-grade evolution. Ruggedized, waterproofed, and modular, the Vision 60 was designed for perimeter security and reconnaissance. At Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida, Vision 60s began patrolling autonomously, reporting intrusions, scanning with thermal sensors, even using AI to recognize threats. In 2021, an experimental version appeared at a defense expo carrying a rifle system, sparking global controversy. Ghost Robotics insisted it remained semi-autonomous. Critics saw the first steps toward killer robots. Either way, the symbolism was clear. The era of unarmed scouts was ending. China quickly answered, its quadrupeds, sleek, modular, domestically produced, now appear in People's Liberation Army drills. Footage shows them disembarking from troop carriers, advancing in formation with infantry, sometimes armed with small automatic weapons. Integrated LiDAR, domestic AI chips, and swarm communications make them cheap and adaptive. Where the US pursues precision, China pursues mass. India joined the race with its own approach, affordability. Startups backed by the Defense Research and Development Organization unveiled low-cost quadrupeds built for mountain logistics. Robots that carry ammunition and rations to high-altitude posts where humans struggle for oxygen. Companies like Arrow Arc prototype dogbots for under a tenth of Western prices. Simpler electronics, longer endurance, easier repairs. But with each improvement, a question grows louder. When a robot can see, move, and decide faster than a soldier, who really leads the fight? It was inevitable. If a robot can carry a sensor, it can carry a weapon. South Korea took the first open step with the SGR A1 sentry gun installed along the demilitarized zone. Equipped with cameras, sensors, and AI recognition, it can warn intruders, identify uniforms, and, if authorized, open fire automatically. Officially, a human remains in the loop, but the technology allows full autonomy. Russia followed with its Uran-9 unmanned combat vehicle, a tracked robot carrying autocannons, rockets, and anti-tank missiles. In Syria, the Uran-9 underperformed, suffering from communication dropouts and limited vision. Yet it proved the concept viable. A robot could carry a tank's firepower without a crew's vulnerability. Turkey's Kargu drones went further. According to UN reports, some units may have conducted autonomous strikes in Libya, selecting and attacking targets without direct human command. That event, if fully verified, could mark the world's first recorded case of a robot making a kill decision on its own. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, small UGVs, unmanned ground vehicles, armed with machine guns and grenade launchers, now patrol trenches and conduct remote attacks. The technology gap between prototype and battlefield has collapsed. Militaries justify the trend through efficiency. A sentry robot doesn't blink. A targeting AI doesn't panic. It processes and reacts in milliseconds, critical when missile defense or close-quarter ambushes allow no time for human deliberation. But beneath the pragmatic logic lies a dangerous shift. The boundary between assisted and autonomous killing is blurring. For now, Doctrine insists a human must authorize every lethal act. Tomorrow, the human might only set the parameters, and the software will do the rest. If quadrupeds are scouts and sentries, humanoids are the ultimate ambition. Machines built not just to fight alongside soldiers, but to become them. The most famous of all is Atlas, created by Boston Dynamics under DARPA's Robotics Challenge. 
Standing 1.5 meters tall and weighing 90 kilograms, Atlas runs, jumps, lifts, and even performs parkour. Its hydraulic limbs and advanced balance algorithms let it maneuver through obstacles like a trained athlete. In recent demos, Atlas has carried heavy boxes, vaulted over gaps, and flipped with gymnastic precision. For now, it remains unarmed and experimental, but its capabilities reveal what humanoid warfighters might achieve. The agility of a human with the endurance of a machine. Then there's Tesla's Optimus, a different philosophy. Optimus isn't built for stunts. It's designed for scalability. Elon Musk's goal is a low-cost, mass-produced humanoid that can work anywhere humans can, including dangerous or monotonous environments. It uses electric actuators, vision-based AI borrowed from Tesla's self-driving program, and modular hands capable of manipulating tools or, one day, weapons. While Tesla frames Optimus as industrial labor, defense analysts see the inevitable. Once the mobility and dexterity exist, militaries will adapt them. Russia's Fedor robot showed another approach, a humanoid designed for teleoperation. It fired pistols, drove vehicles, and even assisted in spacecraft tasks. China's Cyber One and Walker X focus on perception and interaction, mimicking human motion for both industrial and military applications. But why humanoids? Because war zones are built for people. Stairs, hatches, doorways, cockpits, all designed to human scale. A robot that mimics our anatomy can use existing infrastructure without modification. It can carry stretchers, drive vehicles, or replace infantry in urban combat. And that's precisely where the challenge begins. The more robots look, move, and act like us, the easier it becomes to let them decide like us too. A humanoid soldier can navigate a city, distinguish between friend and foe, and execute orders with mechanical precision. But when that decision involves taking a life, the boundary between tool and combatant starts to blur. Here lies the deepest fault line in robotic warfare, accountability. When a robot kills unlawfully, who bears responsibility? The operator? The programmer? The commander? The manufacturer? The United Nations has debated bans on lethal autonomous weapon systems since 2013. Yet progress stalls because no nation wants to limit its advantage. Each argues their systems keep a human in the loop, but that loop grows thinner with each upgrade. Supporters of autonomy argue robots could make war less cruel. They don't feel anger or vengeance. They obey rules precisely. They don't panic. Critics respond that they also don't understand mercy, surrender, or doubt. And those qualities, however flawed, are what separate a soldier from a weapon. International law struggles to keep pace. The Geneva Conventions were written for humans. Robots don't fit neatly into that moral architecture. A malfunctioning algorithm can't stand trial. A commander can't realistically oversee a thousand independent machines making split-second choices. The debate is no longer philosophical, it's urgent. Because the machines are already here, learning, iterating, waiting for orders that may someday never come from humans at all. As machines roll, fly, and crawl into battle, humanity stands at a threshold unlike any before. The promise of robotic warfare is simple. Fewer body bags, faster victories, cleaner wars. But beneath that promise lies a cost we haven't yet counted. The cost of detaching war from the human heart. If a machine can decide who dies, what happens to the concept of courage, sacrifice, or guilt? If no soldier bleeds, do nations think twice before sending their robots to fight? And when an autonomous swarm wins a battle without human eyes ever seeing it, who owns the responsibility or the shame? 
For all their circuitry and code, these war machines mirror us. They reflect our desire for control, our fear of loss, our endless quest to make war safer without making it less frequent. The future battlefield, as intelligent as it may become, will always echo with a question older than any algorithm. When war is fought by machines, does humanity still own the consequences? This concludes our deep dive into the rise of battlefield robots. Do you believe machines will make the battlefield safer or far more dangerous? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this breakdown, don't forget to like, subscribe and ring the bell so you never miss an upload. And while you're here, check out our other episodes on modern military tech, air defense systems and future weapons. Stories that explore how technology is reshaping power, strategy and survival. Thanks for watching and as always, stay sharp, stay curious and we'll see you in the next one.